happy Sabbath to all of you from the Edge Seventh-day Adventist Church and its members. And happy Independence to all of you. We are very happy to be alive and very happy to celebrate our country's independence. And we are very excited that you made a decision to come and join us this morning. We know that you have many options, and yet you decided to come and join uh, the people of God as we open the Word together. We are thankful for what God has been doing with the church. Not just our churches, although we do bless God for what He is doing with our churches, but we are also thankful for what God is doing all around the world. I keep in touch with pastors in Mexico, friends of mine back from when we were in college, and uh, I see what they are doing. All of them meeting online still. I know that there is this uh, dissatisfaction that hits us once in a while about not being able to meet in person, and we forget that we are not the only ones who are going through this uh, pandemic. It's a pandemic because it's a world event and it's not just an event here in the United States of America. There are people in other countries who are actually doing uh, much worse than we are here in this country and uh, who have actually even more restrictions than we have. And so we are thankful for God's protection and guidance of his people and we are thankful and looking forward to the day that we can meet together even uh, with all of the guidelines that we will have to abide by. We don't have to abide by them. We are not being forced to do so. We want to do it because we care for the well-being and the health of our members and our visitors. Let's pray together before we begin the message this morning. Please bow your heads with me. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for the Sabbath day in which we can come together and open your word and fellowship together. I thank you for the leaders of the church throughout the world and especially here in Minnesota. I thank you for the leaders within our churches, The Edge and Cambridge. I ask you, Lord, to continue to bless each and every one of them. We pray for our members who are out there who may be feeling neglected or sad or stressed out. Lord, please uh, put your arms of love around us. Calm our fears. Help us to be on your side. Help us to be on the winning side, the side of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we come together today to uh, ask you to lead us in our study to give us one mind and one spirit, asking for your Holy Spirit to lead and to guide, to help us understand the message that you have given to your servant. And Father, we know that you will do it because we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Today, all of us Americans are celebrating our independence. Today is 4th of July, but independence is more than just barbecues and parades and fireworks, even though sometimes that's all that we do. After all, we remember the struggle that early Americans faced as they stood up for freedom against Great Britain. That in itself took courage for a new country and for people who perhaps didn't have uh, the greatest army or the greatest uh, development as the old country did. I don't aim to spend our whole time together today talking about history, but I do. Would, I would like to uh, highlight a few things and and do like a small synopsis of of the points that I find most interesting and why I find them interesting. You see, it was on April 19, 1775 that the American Revolution broke out uh, between the Americans and the British. 
And during that war period, the Declaration of Independence was made on July 4, 1776. However, it wasn't until 1783 that America finally de defeated uh, the British or Britain and ratified its independence. And that in itself is very interesting to me because the Declaration of Independence comes first before even the end of the war before uh, people are able to celebrate and have parades and have barbecues and you know, you know have this place of fireworks even before that there is this declaration of independence it's almost like seeing beyond yourself it's it's almost like seeing with your mind's eye or believing that what you are declaring will happen in a sense, we could say that they had faith when they did it because it still hadn't happened and yet they were already declaring themselves uh, independent. And that in itself, I think it's, it's, it's great and we need to ratify and we need to highlight. And so today we celebrate independence, but uh, you know, the Declaration of Independence came first in 17. 76 and the celebration of of having ultimately defeated the enemy came afterwards in 1783 as i thought about that order of things you know this declaration of independence coming first this this visionary endeavor of saying we declare ourselves independent from you even before it happened I couldn't help but think of our own spiritual declaration of independence from sin and the celebration that ensued after the war was won by Jesus Christ. In what's left of our time, which probably will, will not be a lot of time, I would like us uh, to think about that and to, and to look at that, our own declaration of independence, how that came about. How was it played out and what were the results afterwards? Our declaration of independence from sin came right away as soon as our first parents, Adam and Eve, fell into sin in the garden. So open your Bibles with me and go to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And this is God admonishing and, and He is actually delivering punishment and judgment upon the transgressors of His law and upon the deceiver Himself. And He says the, the following in, in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, He's uh, talking to, to the serpent, but at the same time, he's talking to Adam and Eve, and they are listening to this promise. I'm going to put enmity, I'm going to put strife between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, between your followers and her seed. Uh, he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the the heel. As soon as men fell into sin, God pronounced the declaration of independence from sin in the form of a messianic prophecy uh, or messianic promise. And the promise that one day our enemy would be defeated. And how was, was it going to happen? It was going to happen by a decisive blow to the head, a decisive bruise to the head of the serpent and he would be defeated by the seed of the woman talk about a visionary you know in the same in the same manner in which uh, the early Americans declared their independence on July 4th uh, even though it hadn't happened yet even though the war was still raging on and it would still take a few years before the war ended in the same vein uh, God, as soon as sin comes into the world, as soon as strife comes, God declares independence. 
and he makes this pronouncement, you know, that I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise you on the head. There's going to come an end to you. Even though you're going to, you are going to hurt him, even though you are going to uh, in some ways punish him, he will gain victory over you and over sin and over death. And so that in itself is visionary. That is looking ahead before it happens. And all of us have to have that vision. We have to have vision, which in itself is faith. Go with me to Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, because in Hebrews chapter 11, we, we are told that, uh, exactly that, actually. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, talks about faith. We know this as the chapter of faith. And here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, we read, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. In other words, of things that haven't happened yet. The conviction of things not seen. You believe in God even though you don't see Him. You believe in eternity with God even though it hasn't happened yet. You have to put on your, your glasses of faith and you have to believe in what the scriptures say and, and that what they say is truth. Well, in the same vein, God uh, had the assurance that one day sin and the devil would be done away with. Sin and transgression and the division that it brought into the perfect world that God had created. He had that assurance. In faith, the promise was made because faith is having the assurance of, of those things uh, we hope for beholding with our mind's eye the realization of that hope. Now, let's go together to uh, Galatians. We are going to spend a lot of time in Galatians, and, and so please keep your finger in Galatians because we're going to come back to it a couple times. We're in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16 because before we read it, when Adam and Eve hear the declaration of independence from sin, uh, they believe it. And we know they believe it because as soon as Eve has her first child, you know, she is excited. She, she is hoping that this is the redeemer of them. I mean, she says, look, a male, a child. Perhaps this is the Redeemer. I mean, that's not in the text, but that is definitely implicit in the original uh, language of the text. Look, could this be the one who is going to redeem us? Of course, we know the story, and that was not the Redeemer. He became the first murderer. Uh, but they understood the promise made. They, they believe the promise made by by God in in the garden and they were looking for to the fulfillment of that promise and it's important for all believers to trust in what God is saying to us to trust and to place our faith in the promises and that is exactly what happened to other characters in the Bible and here in Galatians chapter 3 verse 16 it tells us it says now the promises first of all they were spoken to Adam and Eve but it says now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed he does not say and to seeds as if referring to many but rather to one and to your seed that is Christ you know, Abraham had this this marvelous uh, opportunity of receiving the promise but also of believing in the promise believing that the promise was true believing that from him all the nations of, of the world would be blessed through his seed all the nations would be blessed and and obviously Abraham the father of faith believed that and and it's important 
to realize that that it wasn't something obscure that, that he believed in. He he was given the opportunity to behold the gospel. He was given the opportunity to to know what was going to take place. And and Jesus himself confirms that. So let's go to the gospel of John and leave your finger in Galatians because we'll come back to it. But in the gospel of John, chapter 8 and verse 56, when Jesus himself confirms this, that, that Abraham got to behold him way before the promise was fulfilled. He got to behold Jesus Christ. It says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Because Abraham had believed, because Abraham, when he was called by God to sacrifice his own son, his one and only son, Isaac, the, the, the son of the promise, because he believed that God could resurrect them, because he believed that, that it was God who had called him to do it, and he placed all of his faith in God, even though what God was asking him to do just did, did not make any sense. Because he believed in God and he believed in the promise, God revealed to him uh, the, the whole picture. And he was able to behold Jesus Christ, uh, who, like his son Isaac, was uh, the father's own and one and only son. Who would come and who would die uh, for the sins of the whole world. And through whom all the nations of the world would be blessed. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Abraham believed in the promise and he was granted this marvelous uh, blessing, which is, which is a blessing that all those who believe in God will one day receive. In the same way that Abraham got to behold Jesus, even way before before the, the end of the war, even way before the victory was won, uh, those of us who trust in the promises, those of us who trust in the promises contained within the scriptures, will one day with our own eyes behold Jesus Christ. And that is, that is very important. Now let's go back to Galatians, like I told you. This time we're going to chapter 4 and verses 4 and 5. Because, remember, let's think, let think about it before we read it. The declaration of independence from sin was made from the beginning in the garden to Adam and Eve. It was repeated through the ages. Uh, it was repeated to Abraham, and he believed it, and he beheld it, but it still didn't happen. It was still a ways away, but that doesn't mean that it never came through, and that doesn't mean that it never became a reality, because here in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5, we are told that when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his Son born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. The declaration of independence over sin came first, and after a long, hard struggle and battle between the forces of evil and the forces of good, uh, led by our fearless General Jesus Christ, the war over sin and death was won. And our independence from sin was ratified through the ultimate sacrifice. It always takes the ultimate sacrifice. The same way that our independence and our freedom today has required the ultimate sacrifice of countless of men and women fighting for freedom, the same way Jesus Christ paid the ultimate sacrifice for us on the cross of Calvary. Let's go there and look at that. We are going back to the Gospel of John, chapter 19. 
Gospel of John chapter 19 and verse 30. This is Jesus at the very end when, when he is about to expire his last breath. The Gospel of John chapter 19 and verse 30. It reads like this. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus' death on the cross ensured our freedom. On his dying breath, he, he fulfilled the declaration of independence from sin, made in the Garden of Eden to Adam and Eve and their descendants and the whole universe and each one of us. And so today we, we are able to celebrate we are able to celebrate that freedom that was brought about by Jesus Christ on the cross. First came the Declaration of Independence. In the same way that in our country, first came the, you know, first the war started, and then came the, the Declaration of Independence, and then came the end of the war with victory over the enemy. In the same way, uh, spiritually, it happened the same. The war started, and it started in heaven, and it started be, between the rebellious Satan and his angels that decided to follow him against the angels of Jesus Christ, the general, or Michael, as he is referred in the scriptures, and his angels. And then after that, uh, when he led our first parents into sin, came the declaration of independence from sin. And the fulfillment of that declaration of independence came when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. When he paid the ultimate sacrifice for you and for me. And because of that, because of that sacrifice, we can celebrate. We can begin the celebration now, except for we still have to wait for the fulfillment of everything made new. But the war has been won. Yes, we can remember, we can go back, we can, we can celebrate, we should celebrate that we are free men and women in Jesus Christ. Actually, uh, heaven itself celebrated that fact. And if, if we go to uh, Revelation in chapter 5, we can see how uh, heaven itself celebrated. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, we're going to begin with verse 9. We're going to probably read quite a few verses, but this is Jesus coming back home. This is homecoming of Jesus back to heaven after he defeated the enemy on the cross of Calvary by paying the ultimate sacrifice. And this is homecoming. All of the angels, all of heaven's beings, uh, all of the redeem and God and the cherubims and the elders, they're all together and they're awaiting this coming of, of their victorious hero. And let's pick it up in verse 9, even though we could begin in verse 1, but I'll let you do that at home by yourself. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals for you, were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nations. By paying the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus won our independence from sin. He won our freedom. Verse 10, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with, a, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. 
they were worshiping, they were celebrating because the war over sin and death was won by Jesus Christ. They were excited. And we should be excited when we think about our independence from sin. Because thanks to Jesus Christ, we no longer are slaves. Thanks to Jesus Christ, we are now free men and women. And we can and should celebrate. Let's go back to Galatians, though. Galatians chapter 5. Because we are told precisely that here in Galatians chapter 5 in verse 1. Galatians chapter 5 in verse 1, it tells us exactly that same message. And it reads, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Christ died to give us freedom. And so today, uh, yes, today we are celebrating the, the, the independence of the United States of America and we get excited and, you know, we see or throw fireworks and, and we celebrate and there's parades and, and it's important for us as Americans to be proud of our country and to, and to be thankful for the sacrifice made for us so that today we can enjoy freedom but without forgetting that our ultimate freedom came from Jesus Christ. Our ultimate freedom came from Jesus Christ as he died on Calvary for you and for me. Because it was for, for freedom that Christ set us free. No longer are we bound for, by the old yoke of, of slavery, but we are able to celebrate our freedom from sin. But a question still remains because, as I said earlier, uh, we are still awaiting the fulfillment of other promises made by God and other promises made by Jesus Christ, like, I will come again and take you to myself. And we still have to uh, look at those promises with the same eyes of faith. We still have to behold the promise and believe the promise and not give up on the fight because there's still a fight raging. Even though the enemy is defeated, even though Jesus Christ defeated Satan on the cross, he is still raging. He is still causing pain. He is still trying to take as many people, free men and women, with him down to the grave to enslave them back up for them to forget that they are free and that they no longer have to be slaves of sin and so the question still remains uh, how how do we ensure our ultimate victory how how can how can we be witnesses of what we believe by faith right now and uh, the answer to that, we find it in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2 and verse 3. Hebrews 12, 2 and 3. And it reads like this. The, the way that we can overcome is by fixing our eyes on Jesus. The author and finisher or perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Yes, we experience uh, oppression, we experience uh, trials, we experience hostility by sinners. Uh, we can even uh, experience persecution. And yet, if we fix our eyes on Jesus, 
who is the one that begins the work of faith within our hearts, then we can ultimately overcome the world. So today, as we go on our day, and especially tonight, because today is the Sabbath, I hope that you're not out there uh, breaking the Sabbath. Uh, wait till tonight to celebrate until the, the sun has, has gone done. But today, as we think about freedom, let's not forget to think about the freedom that, that Jesus Christ brought and won for all of us. That is something worth celebrating. That is something worth remembering. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for the freedom in Jesus Christ. And we also thank you so much for the freedom that we have as Americans, won by the fight of many men and women who were willing to pay the ultimate price to realize their dream of independence. Help us not to forget either one of them, but Help us as we have to go through this life uh, and uh, st still being attacked on all sides. And as the fight gets even stronger in the last days, may we never forget to uh, behold Jesus Christ. And to know that by beholding Him, we are being transformed into His likeness. And to know that He is... Uh, the one who begins the work in us, and he is also the one who completes the work in us. And so today we accept Jesus as our Savior, we accept Jesus as our hero, we accept Jesus as our Redeemer, and we do so in his holy and precious name. Amen. We thank you once again for joining us this morning. May you be blessed the rest of this day. May the Lord keep you and watch over you and your families.